Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's called In a Lonely Place with Matt Pinfield. Song by New Order, a song by Smithereens. A Humphrey Bogart movie. What we're doing here is, you know, we're doing things for musicians that are really struggling right now. And people in the music community are raising money to try and literally help people out because people don't know where their next paycheck or their bill is going to come from. I mean, this COVID thing really derailed so many people, including me. I mean, everyone. But, but the truth is, for me, this is a godsend. It's a gift. It's a gratitude thing because I get to go on here, interview my friends that I love and musicians I respect. And we talk about how they're getting through it and also their careers and then the seven records that literally changed their lives. I have a guy on today that I love so much. You know, I uh, always was a fan of his band, South Gang. Marvelous Three, I debuted them on MTV back in the day with Freak of the Week and all that stuff. And then we became friends. And he got involved in a record that I made when I was, you know, an A&R guy at Columbia Records, a band called Midtown. But we have a mutual, like, best friend, this guy, Jonathan Daniel. So it was this thing that we figured out that we're just music fanatics. We're like, that's who we are. And I'm very grateful for that, you know. So I have Butch Walker with me, who I love as an artist, producer, songwriter, and one of the most beautiful human beings. What's up, Butch? Matt, that just made me feel so good. I can go now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, man. I love you. You like, dude, like, your spirit has always been a part of the thing when I met you, you know, and uh, supported you from the beginning. And then we got involved in different like aspects of our careers. But I, I was just, definitely full of a lot more spirits back then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I think we both were. Yeah, yeah we definitely were. <laughs> yes, we both were. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so, but truthfully, Butch, it's amazing. Like, you've become like a literally, like, you found a way through everything that you've done as a great songwriter, a collaborator, a producer. You've gone through shit like before, like, I talked to Aaron from Animal Nation when his studio burned down. Your studio burned down before anyone else's. That was, like, a thing that when you, we both, you know, one of the things that's going on with me with COVID right now and all this is, I realize that the material things aren't as important as the people I love, the music, the songs. But it's also, but, it, but it's a hard thing to go through. But you soldiered through it, and it was just amazing to me. And so I want to talk to you about you know, what's going on with you right now? I mean, you have, you know, obviously, number one alternative record with Green Day. Oh, yeah. You produced that record. Produced that album. And, you know, yeah, fuck man. all motherfuckers. You know, when I heard that. I was like, yeah, it's fucking, it sounded like distortion and garage rock. Yeah. I, I know that Billy Joe said to me that he was like, kind of going for a Prince thing, but it was also a little more like, it was just fucking cool. Uh, talk yeah. to me about working on that record. Oh man, it was, first of all, it was a dream come true to get to work with those guys because I'm a huge fan and I'm not very good at being that cool guy that's like when I'm really into, like when I'm really into somebody, uh, I, I I can't just see them and go like, well, so, you know, I, I'm not like that. I like, I'm like, oh my God, I love your records. I'm into you, blah, 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 blah. Who, no matter if it's actors or whoever. We're not um, fakes. We're not fakes, dude. You and I are like, that, yeah, right. you're, 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 an ex, you're kind of extroverted with your opinions on things as well. As well. And, um, and I love that. And so when my, my manager, the Jonathan Daniel, who was our, our correlation here, you and I, uh, he, uh, he started managing Green Day. And the first thing I did was I texted him. I said, you, you, have, to, you have to get me on the phone with Billy Joe. I have to try to convince them to let me produce him. And I don't ever do that with, you know, when Jonathan has an artist, I don't like invite myself to the party because he's managing some huge artists. And, uh, it just so happens that I've produced several of them and that's not just because it's convenient and in the family, but it's because I love those artists and Green Day being uh, kind of one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, he was able to get me on the phone with Billy and Billy was in the right place at the right time in his life where he had been producing his own records for the last 10 years and was burnt out on doing it and needed some fresh perspective and some fresh ideas and uh, but still be Green Day and be what he wanted and, and you know, retain his vision, which is most important. Like if an artist has a vision to do something, I'm not going to derail that. 
And his vision was to make a record that was outside of the Green Day box a little bit uh, and still be Green Day, which I know that sounds like a, a puzzle, but it really was great because he just started sending me demos. And, you know, the first couple of things he sent me, I was like, oh, God, this is this is so fun and so great. And I would put down some ideas and send them back. And, you know, he'd be in the Bay Area and I'd be down in uh, L.A. And so he would we would just go back and forth and um, finally and we just started really hitting off on every on each other's ideas. And uh, and then it got to talking to Trey and to Mike and next thing you know they're all down here and we're all crammed in this little room back here behind me <laughs> uh, all plugged in and uh man it just it, it was one of my favorite records i've ever worked on you guys did it no, no, what is it 32 minutes maybe 30 um 10 songs it's kind of cool because it brought brought everybody back to the lookout days but more importantly it was just like a, a shift of gears and they are the really the sweetest guys I and mean, i love them you know they're they're friends forever worked on a lot of things with them yeah, uh, you know, and play, you know, like I said, when after I got hit by the car, Trey Cole pulls me aside and goes, dude, don't forget, the, it's not lost on us how hard you work to learn to walk again and fucking lose weight and all this. Goes, don't, you know, and it was just beautiful because sometimes you need to hear that from your friends, you know, you be having a bad week, whatever that is. But anyway, so Butch, you and I have a mutual person besides Jonathan Daniels, there's two people in our lives that we love so much. Jonathan Daniel and Leslie Fram. Now, Leslie yes. Fram is, you know, she works at CMT. She's a brilliant woman, family to us. Um, in Atlanta, of course, you know, you were down there. Uh, she was very, very, such a champion of yours. Tell me about... I mean, I, I honestly can say that I wouldn't be... I wouldn't have probably met you... Uh, and be sitting right here right now if it weren't all going back to this wonderful human named Leslie Fram. And Leslie, um, for anybody out there that needs to know, she's the uh, head like, um, you know, person at CMT that does the, she's like the music, uh, whatever you want. I, I don't know the title. Head of music strategies and everything. Yeah. Yes. Uh, whereas in radio back in the, back in the 90s, she was the program director, which was the head person that helped program the stations, uh, the station with their playlist, right? And, and it, so, it's bad, right. So 99X, right. And it was like that state was so important. Even Elton John would come up there and bring his keyboards yeah. to like play piano and talk about Travis. And you know what yes. I mean? Yeah. There's something about owning Atlanta and, you know, me, I'm born in Athens, yeah. Georgia. So, you know, the whole thing. But I, she's just an amazing woman and she just loved right. the champion. Yeah, so, she definitely took good care of me, man. She was, uh, she, I didn't have a pot to piss in and nobody wanted to sign my, my music. Nobody cared. Uh, we, you know, we were this scrappy band of guys in Atlanta that were wearing eyeliner and skinny ties and looked like, you know, like a band from New York in, in, in the late seventies, early eighties or something. And we're doing this like really kind of quirky power pop stuff, which it just wasn't fashionable at the time. And we didn't care about that. And she didn't either because it, I walked into um, her office with this guy, Steve Craig, who was one of the DJs there who did the local, the locals only yeah, show I, I on Sunday nights. At RXP, you know, he was like my midday after me and Leslie. Yes. And, and he, he uh, was instrumental in this because he was a big believer in Marvelous 3 uh, when he was a DJ at, at 99X and would play us on the local show on Sunday nights. And I went up there and handed him my CD at the time. There was a blank CD-ROM that had the name Marvelous 3 written on it. And he, he stuck it in at his cubicle in his CD player and started playing the first song, played about 30 seconds of it, liked it, said, that's great. And then he put fast forward to the next song and, and it was uh, Freak of the Week. And he got to the chorus and before the, before the second verse even kicked in, he took it out and said, come with me. And he walked right into Leslie's office when she was in the middle of a fucking meeting. And I'm sitting there behind him like this going like, what are we doing? And he goes, he goes, Leslie, you got to hear this right now. And Leslie said, let's do it. And so Leslie put it on, which I, you know, you, I get, you got to give people credit when they're in that world where you, they can be, you can be a slave to your, um, to, to influencers in, in radio and pro, and playlists and being, you know, tight with what you play uh, she took chances and was like, I'm going to break something local because I have local pride. And so she played it and she played 30 seconds of Freak of the Week and said, 
this song's a hit and I want to play it on my station and in heavy rotation. And I was like, please don't fucking be lying to me. <laughs> Cause I'm, I was like, my life has been, you know, a, it's the struggle was real for years and years leading up to that. Uh, and so she was like, no, nope, I'm going to start playing it tomorrow. And it went into rotation and we, every re record label that turned us down was offering us huge record deals. And it, it was crazy. And, and the song ended up being a top five hit and paved the way for everything, paved the way for me, for my producing career. Because of that song, I did that record and did that song in particular, all that in my bedroom. And uh, cause I could never afford to go into big studios. I always had to just like do it on whatever scrappy gear I had, you know, and which wasn't much. And so I ended up, um, I ended up getting that, uh, you know, uh, getting calls from artists that were, you know, from labels that were signing artists going like, Hey, we want to, we want to make a record that sounds like this record that you have for your band. And it just snowballed from there. How did you, uh, and then you went into production, which was for me really amazing. And also co-songwriting. Obviously you and I, like we said, Jonathan Daniel, a close, close friend of ours. Um, but how did you make that transition where you decided, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna write with people, I'm gonna collaborate. And then you wrote so many hits with so many people and you continue to do that. How well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I enjoy it. It was, it was basically, uh, it was by accident because after Freak Louie happened, uh, that song from my band, The Marvelous Three, I got a call to do another band uh, and, and work on a song of theirs. And then that song uh, got bigger than the song that, that I had for my band. Uh, it actually went closer to number one, I think. And then I started getting calls from everyone, like from, you know, Avril Lavigne, uh, it, you know, pop stuff like that. And and I remember when I got that call to do that, I came up and, and went to uh, New York City and was in Koreatown and at the studio there. And she had, you know, just come off of selling, you know, 10 million records on the first album at that point, which was a massive, massive record. Um, and it's quiet, complicated and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it was because of it was because of the stuff I had done for the other band, the song that I told you I did. And then also this band called Simple Plan. I did a single for them. They happened to be on tour with with Avril at the time. And they were talking me up to her as like, oh, you should get in the studio with this new guy named uh, Butch Walker. And um, and so it was between, you know, them and Evan Taubenfeld, who now works for Crush Management, who works for Jonathan Daniel. He was yeah. he was uh, Avril's guitar player at the time and yeah. also was like, he was also hitting her up saying I should work with her. And then I went in and wrote um, and co-wrote and uh, produced a, a, a song called, um, uh, it was called, um, uh, oh, what was the first one called? Uh, Don't Tell Me. And, yeah. and it became a song that uh, later it was going to be the first single. But until then, we didn't know that. And they, the, the label put her with all kinds of people, all kinds of big hit producers at the time and big names and stuff. And then she called me back months later. I'd not heard anything for months. And then she hit me back because that was just a demo I did at the time uh, up in New York. And then she said, well, everybody likes the stuff you did the best. So you want to get together and try to write and do another song? And I said, sure. And so we got together and I had these lyrics scribbled down on a Chateau Marmont napkin. Um, <laughs> and they were for, uh, they were, they were, uh, for a song called um, So Much For My Happy Ending. And that song uh, became the second single and the first number one single. So that became a number one single for me uh, right out, right out of the bat. And, um, and that was, uh, that was the beginning of, of where it all, you know, started from there with, you know, then, then Pink and then Katy Perry and then, then Switch Gears and Seven Dust. Uh, Injected was a, a metal band I worked with back in Atlanta. That, um, that, for me, you did. Remember you, uh, we, we didn't, we, you, you produced that Midtown record for me. And Midtown, who I, who I love. And that was, that was a very, that was the beginning of that, of me doing a lot of records in that scene as well, because that was early on in the, uh, whatever you want to call it, the emo world, you know, but, uh, but I was, I became friends with Gabe uh, and, uh, oh, and man, Rob did. Great. I love Gabe, you know that. Yeah, all those guys, all those guys. And, um, and so we just ended up, uh, you know, I just kept going and kept going and didn't look back. I opened up a studio in Atlanta uh, and just 
started fucking making record after record and making my records and touring and I'm fucking tired now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I gotta tell you what's, what's amazing is the thing about you and your international following has always been so brilliant. Like I watch people back even back when you did and through Bohemian Rhapsody on the end of the one CD, I think it was a Japanese CD, right? Yeah. I, I played it on the radio at K Rock in New York. Um, before people were like, you know, getting excited about Queen again, you know, yeah. I know of course I loved Queen. I saw them in 1976, Night at the Opera Tour, a little kid in the nosebleeds. Dang. Later on, Brian May, as you know, hired me to write the liner notes for the eight CD box they called the Crown Jewels. But I just got to say, like you, when you decided to do that and break that down, it really blew people away. Like you're <laughs> like, I'm just gonna, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reconstruct this. Tell me about that, like. Was it because you loved the album so much? Was it? Just oh, yeah, well, yeah. Queen was one of my first loves. I mean, you know, for sure. I, I you know, one of the records we'll talk about, obviously, you know, well, I wore it. Yeah, in like 10 minutes, but yeah, but you know. But yeah. my thing is, I love that you, you know, but, but your songwriting and seeing you live at like Irving Plaza in New York, your fan base is so devoted and beautiful. Do you... Is that one of the things that really, it's got to keep you going during these times? Because you and I oh. went through, well, you already went through that rough time we talked about. But when your yeah. studio burned down, you and I had this conversation. You made the record about it. You also made the record about life. You talked about life. You talked about different, you literally broke down so many things in your life through song, which was, for me, really, really therapeutic because I needed it through some rough shit. And um, whatever, you know, but I mean, yeah, it's not about me right now. But I'm just going to say, but I really wanted to say to you, like, what was that like at that period of time? Because, Butch, you know, we have to always grab inner strength. That's what we're going through now during this COVID thing. We're doing it for our families. We're doing it for the people we love. We're doing it for our friends. And, like, I just, I, I remember me and Leslie interviewing you in New York City, talking about when the studio burned down. And I just, it, like, just ripped. It had something in my heart. I was like, man, this is. Butch is fucking such a strong human being, like fighter. So tell me about that. Well, I mean, it, it, it's very hard to go through any loss, whether it be loss of a loved one or loss of your house and loss of your personal items that you grew up, you know, cultivate, culminating this like, you know, amazing pile of gear that I'd worked with since I was a kid. My first guitars, uh, every master recording I'd ever done since I was a teenager, all the when when all when all that gets like taken out from under you in a, in a wildfire, um, you know. You, you, I, I look back on it now, and I, you know, you're you're always like, why me, why me, right? And then um, and then you go, it, it well because it was it was supposed to happen. There, you know, you don't think it is, but whatever happened it, it, when like say that when that tragedy happened, it it just it opened up the the floodgates uh, creatively for me and emotionally for me, because I know in retrospect, before that had happened, I had just finally started getting successful after having no money and broke as a joke my whole life and not being able to, you know, even ever pay rent or do anything. Um, and then all of a sudden I've got like, you know, two fancy cars and a bunch of motorcycles and a ton of gear. And that's the big, this big, this big nice house that's in Malibu and like I, whatever I'm doing fine now. And, and, but the problem is, is I couldn't really feel anything anymore. I was starting to get uh, numb and desensitized and feeling like I didn't have anything to say anymore. And that's sad because I was still very young. You know, this was um, after the birth of my son who was only six months old when the, when the fire happened and um you know, there was just a lot of things going through my mind at that point about like, it, is music even it for me anymore? And that's fucked up to even think that now. But but like I was get, thinking about just quitting and getting out. I didn't even want to do it anymore. And then the fire happened and I lost everything. I came back from with my family from New York City from playing an acoustic show at Maxwell's in Hoboken. Yeah. And um, all I had was the two acoustic guitars with me to my name. And that was it in a suitcase. And I'm talking, you know, you're talking about losing 50 vintage guitars and, you know, 
50 vintage microphones and, and, and drum kits and, and just crazy amounts of like personal stuff and family heirlooms from lost loved ones. And, you know, it, it, it was, it was hard. It was a hard hit for the whole family. And, um, and so, but for some reason after that, I couldn't stop writing and I didn't stop writing for years and years and years. And, and a lot of that stuff became more personal and the most personal, the most personal stuff that I had ever written for myself. And um, I think that that connected uh, at the risk of sounding, you know, pretentious or whatever. I think it connected to fans uh, on a, on a much more visceral level, which was, which was necessary. You know, and that was the thing about all of it. Like Afraid of Ghosts, like I listened to that record. I loved it so much, man. Uh, I mean, many, I mean, of course it was, you had no heart to speak before it, but I'm thinking like, but there, there's different times in your writing, in your cycle of writing for yourself, that I realized that you have an amazing gift to be able to write with and for other people, but you can still pull it back and make it about you when, it, when it's the right time. And it's why I'm afraid of ghosts. I was fucking in love with that album, dude, I got to tell you. you know yeah, I mean? thank you. That was one of that song that, you know, that, that, that song in particular in that album was all about my father and my father had just passed away, you know, months before I made that record. Uh, and I couldn't write about anything except him and my childhood with him. And he was my best friend and, um, he died of pancreatic cancer in 2013. Uh, and it, it was just, uh, that was a time when I needed, uh, music the most. And that record is one of my favorites. I, I don't think it's a favorite of, of uh, my fans in particular, because it's a very sad record. And unfortunately they like it when I'm being silly, sarcastic, funny, loud. Like when, better when you were in the beginning, right? Like, I mean, that, the solo record yeah. too. But at the same but it, time, I think that- but it, Hey, if I had a dollar though, Matt, if I had a dollar for every single like fan that came up to me uh, at shows and said, you know, I didn't, I didn't like that record when you put it out and I dismissed it. And then I lost my father or I lost my mother or I lost my grandmother or whatever. And it's my favorite record of yours now. And it's, it's funny, not funny, but weird how that happens, how yeah. it just takes, unfortunately, somebody going through the same thing I went through when I did that for it to connect. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm glad it exists. Oh, I'm so glad it exists, man. And you know, when the next record's coming out, American Love Story, you, you know, which is coming out in a few couple of weeks. Like, talk to me yeah, about May this 8th. record. Yes, tell me about the new record, American Love Story. I mean, you've always been able to get your finger on the pulse of things that get straight to the heart. And I love that about you, you know? But you're right, but you also have that sense of humor in other ways. So I've, I've just always enjoyed your songwriting. And I've also seen Thank how you. it influences other people that you've worked with. But I want to tell me about the new record. I want to, I really want to know about it. Well, uh, the new record is a rock opera and I mean, that's exciting maybe to me and maybe to you. I don't know about the rest of the world because it's not very <laughs> fashionable to put out a fucking rock opera record right now. But, uh, but you know what? I wrote this record and recorded it two years ago and I sat on it and I didn't even know if I was going to ever even put it out. I thought about just putting it out under a different name or whatever. I just was like, I don't know if I can put this out. And mainly because you know, it's a rough, it's a rough go lyrically in, in a lot of spots. And the reason why is because it is a, it, you know, it's a, it's from beginning to end, it's a love story about hate in America. Yeah. And I know a lot of people will immediately hear that word or hear the word America or hear the word racism and bigotry or whatever. And they'll just tune out because they don't want to, they don't want to be challenged or, or listen to that. They don't want, they don't like it when their artists get social or whatever, but, um, you know what? I couldn't write about anything else over the, like uh, two or three years ago, I was just sitting around just stewing about, you know, I grew up in the South. I grew up in, the, in rural Georgia, North Georgia mountains, where it was very normalized, including in, in, in my circles and including with me, it was normalized behavior to just be in on the, you know, the, the, the racist jokes, the, the, the bigot jokes, the, the homophobic, you know, talk, everything was just so, uh, it was so normal and so okay to be that way back back then and, and in that small town. And, and, and it's still like that in a lot of places now. And it's still like that with a lot of people I know. And um, I just wasn't down with that. And, and, and I kind of, I climbed out of that, you know, as from my childhood 
and I'm glad that I did. Uh, but you know, I just couldn't see myself putting a record out like that. Uh, but it, it got to the point where it, you know, when I started laying this thing down, I didn't know it was going to be a concept, like a rock opera concept record at all. It was just, there was a common theme running with the first few demos. And I sent them to Jonathan, my manager. And, uh, and he said, sounds like you've got a rock opera concept record here. And I was like, Hmm, I didn't think of that. <laughs> and so it started, it, it, you know, it sparked my, my mind to like come up with ca characters and parlay this into a story. And so what it does, it goes through the story that's sort of in the timeline of my youth and, and, and uh, the soundtrack to it is, uh, you know, sonically and production wise is what I was listening to on the radio at, the, at those times. So it's kind of like late 70s through the through the mid 80s pr production. Right. I got to ask you about that. So like, you know, I think about those songs that were like, you know, out at that time. So, I mean, we're going to go through your 10 favorite albums in like two minutes, but or no, your seven favorite records, excuse me. But I'm just like, what was the thing when you had to draw? influence and you had to draw inspiration from those songs what were the songs or the artists that were a part of american love story well when you listen to it there there's a there's a there's definitely a common thread of fleetwood mac going all the way through it because i'm such a huge lindsey buckingham fan, fan. Oh, but I love um, and I love christine mcvee and i think the two of them together you know are magic uh everybody always thinks it's buckingham nicks but i think it's buckingham and mcvee that are the sauce yeah. that that uh make fleetwood mac so fucking good uh and i was loving the production on on all of those records from all the way from uh rumors all the way up to you know to tango those those were the records that were that that had a sonic footprint that i loved that lindsay was chasing something that was new yeah uh, and you know. he was pioneering it for pop music, which was which was amazing. But it was also it was just so much cool shit right around that time. I and mean, I love the way that the sounds of these records, like um, you know, everything from early Doobie Brothers records and uh, yeah, those records. Fuck anybody who talks shit. Sorry. I, yeah, I exactly. Said I wasn't gonna curse. <laughs> said I wasn't gonna curse today. I wasn't gonna use the f word. But dude, uh, I, I sorry, mean, I've used it a ton already. Yeah, to to Street, man. I listen to that song. To Lose Street, yes. God, on that album because I'm listening to music, but the song is so beautiful. Yep. Something about it, you feel like you're on the streets of New Orleans, and of course, China Grove, Long Train Running, those records, dude. Are Black Water. I mean, like you know, dude. You yeah. know. Uh, uh, and what a fool believes. What, what a, a jam. I, I actually like that stuff too. I you listen. I make no apologies. I love the Michael McDonald era too. Dude, real, there, real love. there is so much of that on American Love Story. There's yeah. you'll hear like you'll hear it and go like, that's straight up Michael McDonald. And I was and a lot of Toto too. Like people can, I mean, oh, I get it, Africa cute. Every you know, it's back and it's big and yeah. everybody made that. But fuck it, I liked it when it came out and I like it again now. Dude, and, Steve and, is one of the coolest guys, man. I've spent time with him. He's the best. He's the best, dude. He's got the greatest sense. He's of one of my he's one of my biggest guitar influences ever. And I got to tell him oh. that at NAMM show in January. And it was the coolest thing because I came up and I just hugged him and I was like, you have no idea. And I can't wait for you. To, I want to I want to play you my new record because I copied your style all over it. There's Luca Thur guitar, guitar solos on every song. And, bad, and, bad the, and he was so cool. And it was cool because he was a mutual fan, which blew my mind. I was like, how do you even know who the hell I am? That's so weird. But it was really awesome. And right. uh, so th those are those are a lot of the influences on on that record. And, you know, I love that. You know, I, I, it's funny how like we go back to the things we love growing up and other things. And we're like, sometimes you go back to records and you go, you know, this was OK with me then. Now I love it. Like you, you go back and you find things that were just like at the time they were hits. And then you realize, God, I love that song. And now, I, yep. you know. And that was the way I felt about those later Doobie records. I uh, I love those records. And, so you know, good. And too, I'm a Steely Dan. I love Steely Dan. So. Yeah. Anyway. All that, everything from Yacht Rock all the way to you know New York, New Wave. All I mean, all of it. There was just there's yeah, just I'm a total you, New Wave. I, you know, I love all that stuff. And that was I like, could go all day with you on music, bro. And and I know you and I can be. <laughs> it's the best thing about us, dude. You, me, and Jonathan, and like our friends in like a room, the three of us. He'd be like. Nick Gilder, rock me. And, uh, you know, like, whatever. Oh, we'd yes. Be, we'd be, yes. like, talking about you know, stars. You know, we'd be, like, it would be fun, you know. I like but the, I wanna... uh, go ahead, go ahead. 
No, go ahead. What, you know, I'm I was just going to start going deep. I was going to go. I like the Nick Gilder song on the first uh, Pat Benatar in the Heat of the Night record that he wrote. I think it was called Rated X. That song. Yeah. That's a yeah, dope song. That's you know, a great, love, and, and it's so it's so it's so uh, uh, Gilder. Like when you listen to it, it's just basically straight up yeah. Gilder. But his band, I think, was her band. I believe it was. I believe it was. Uh, uh, Myron Grumbacher on drums, and uh, I could be wrong, but I think it was Neil Giraldo on guitar, who is Pat yeah, Benatar's no, husband. Was, and yeah. It was Roxy Roller and all that early stuff. And man, I got to tell you, the first Pat Benatar album, man, I love <sighs> We Live For Blew song. my mind. You're a heartbreaker, dreammaker. Right. And you know what I'll do? Talker, sweet, no, you don't, which is so <laughs> great. From sweet, so Jeff good. Hard. I love those. So records. good. So Butch, I'm you know I'm so happy to have you here, and you your your resume is unbelievable. And I'm so grateful that you came and did my show because it's like it's getting us through. It thanks for easy. thanks for having me on. Kidding me, man? I love you. You know that. So I'm going through your records right now. One of my favorite records. I'm sure we you know we have stories for it, but I want to hear yours. Kiss Destroyer, the fourth studio album. Fucking. When I heard Detroit Rock City the first time, I was like, arr, 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 arr. I mean, into, into the nighttime world into fucking those. It just killed me. That so talk to me why you love it. I mean, I don't even know where to start. My first concert ever was Kiss. I was eight years old. It was 1977 at the Omni in Atlanta. My mom and dad reluctantly took me uh, because I begged and begged and begged to go. I was like, I don't care. Make it my Christmas present. Make it. It was they were doing two nights, New Year's Eve. It was the 30th and the 31st of December. And um, it was it was life changing. It was the, it changed my life. Like, I mean, I mean, I was only eight at the time, but it was like, I knew what I, I, I the path that I was going to go on was this. Um, yeah. And I mean, a lot of rockers have that story, you know, uh, that same story about kiss, but um, you know, that was the love gun album, uh, which, you know, the only thing I regret is due to my age and whatever is I, didn't well, get exposed. destroyer tour you're saying like you was, was yeah i didn't get it well i didn't get exposed in time to see them on the destroyer tour the destroyer tour was 1976 i believe yeah. so 77 was love gun rock and roll over both great and, um, you know it's yeah like, great records great like, records you ever heard nine snails through love gun that was so badass oh yeah yeah it's so great and I but stole just, your love and all those like great tunes. Yeah, dude, that, that album was huge for me. But Destroyer, though, even as a little kid, for some reason, I knew that this record was a, a, a step up for the band uh, that paved the way for Love Gun and many, many albums to come. But, um, you know, but that was that was Bob Ezrin and Bob Ezrin, the, the producer who is a master uh, of his craft and he's you know he did he did he did the wall you know for yeah. pink floyd and that's and alice he, cooper records alice cooper yeah. big bang oh, babies the billion, the billion dollar babies band. billion dollar babies oh, nice. he did um he did um yeah sorry i quoted an stp lyric just then for some reason but um stp you can quote it anytime i love i love the good band. uh i my, my brain gets foggy after all these song titles and album titles but um but that album like just the, the from the get-go the opener the epic like the dude getting in the car and turning on and kiss is playing on the radio and and he's driving and then it's it's so cinematic from the get-go but some of the songs too you're just like wait this is insane like good expectations gene simmons i mean yeah. singing this like beautiful like almost like almost phil specter-esque yeah that's what he's going for right he was going You've for a like, got great yeah and, and it's and just it's like so funny because that side, right? Like Detroit Rock City, fucking king of the nighttime world is like oh, back to back, those two ever. Like, yep. like a, and it goes out of the a car crash, and dude, and it's just like it comes in. Yep, like got a got a thunder. Greatest vocals ever, Paul Staley's greatest vocals ever. Oh that. man, there's just so much. There's so much good stuff on there. Sweet pain, I love sweet pain. Oh, sweet That's pain the pain was not a sweet pain. <laughs> my love will drive you in <laughs> hey look we're out friends so we can do it dude i love sweet pain yeah um yeah and it's shouted out loud is classic it's it's one of their it's one of their biggest songs ever it's it's the live anthem shout it out you loud know, but, i don't know but you, if, I, if you if you know the story but you know i loved kiss and i was with alex coletti who you know 
can, comes into my office at MTV and goes, hey, Matt, what the fuck's wrong with the music department? He goes, they don't want to do a kiss on plug. I go, I go, let's go talk to them. So I walk into the boss's offices and I go, look, you know, come on, kiss. Every record goes gold without any promotion. Let's, I mean, I mean and they go, they thought it over, did the kiss unplugged. I remember the moment that Peter Chris and Ace Freely were over the balcony because it was there for all the rehearsals. They're like, hey, motherfuckers. And they were like, <laughs> so crazy. And then they, you know, of course, did the songs. He started with Coming Home, one of my favorites from Out in Hell. But oh, then yeah. they did the thing. And it changed. They were ready now to do the reunion. So they took me and Alex Coletti out to, out to lunch at Carmine's on 44th Street. And um, they really appreciated the fact that we fought for them. And, you know, Alex, of course, has done so much work with Kiss since then. He and his brother, Roger, who I love. But she calls me. I narrated the documentary called Second Coming, which was the thing where it was all the whole thing after. And I remember it well because I'm going to tell, I'm going to convince, I'm going to confess something really funny before we do this, but you'll laugh. He's like, Gene offers me one, one, one amount of money. And then he goes, I go, Gene, I mean, dude, I go, I got I've got to do it in a studio. I don't want to spend every cent. I go, I'll do anything for you guys. I want to be part of Kiss's history. So I do the that thing. History. History, right. But the best part of it was I got to do something that was a dream for every Kiss fan ever. And there are two lines left on the voiceover. So he takes me to lunch, Gene, and then brings me to rehearsals at Coles in LA. And Ace and Peter are in the parking lot and they go, where the fuck have you guys been? And he goes, hey man, I was taking Matt out to lunch. Paul doesn't show up for a couple hours. Paul, what happens is, I don't want to drag this on because I'd rather hear you talk, but I will tell you, <laughs> dream came true that I look at the set list and Gene goes, oh, you like it, man? I go, yeah. He goes, you want to have a go? So I sang... Rock Bottom, 100,000 Years, and Do You Love Me with three original members of KISS. And after I did Rock Bottom, Gene looks at me and goes, you got a fucking voice. You actually can sing, man. Because you don't sound like you talk. What else you want to do? And that was when Peter Chris yelled out, do you love me? And Woo! it was surreal. <laughs> and it was nuts, man. It was crazy. It was like, dude, like, come on. I mean, that it's was- a dream come true, it was right? A, yeah, it was beautiful. Beautiful moment for me. But the point so is, awesome. hey, it's about you, it's not about me. And I and I listen, I, I I interject my stories because our buddy Jonathan said to me and Mark Marin and other people are like, oh, man, tell me your stories too, man. You gotta do it. And I'm like, okay, cool. I will. Anyway, so yeah. Van I love hearing yeah. your stories. I could listen to you talk all damn night. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it much. So Van Halen, fair warning, man. What oh, fuck you got yeah. wrecked. Fucking is so. All right, there I am. I, I should be penalized. Another fine, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Okay, so again, again, the, the the way that parlays into Van Halen from Kiss is, I was you know growing up a little kid in in Cartersville, Georgia, not a lot of exposure to anything hitting on the underground yet. You know, there it just didn't happen. You know, you just whatever was played, whatever single from a band played on the ra on the radio station from Atlanta. That's yeah. what you heard. Uh, and and uh, this was right around the dawn of MTV. So it would have been pre being able to discover music via videos. Yes. Um, and um, I remember I had the Love Gun album and I think I was probably 10 or 11, 12. I don't even remember anymore. But my sister's boyfriend, uh, Phil Orton, he, li he lived a block away from our house. He had this album uh by this band called van halen and it was it was van it, and it was van halen one and so whenever he said hey i'll trade you for your kiss alive your 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 your, your kiss love gun album for this van halen record i was like sure let's do it and i did it and never looked back i was obsessed with that from that point i didn't want to be a drummer because of peter chris from kiss i wanted to be a fucking guitar player because of eddie van halen yeah. And that was uh, massive for me was just, it, it was like music from outer space. It just sounded like a space alien playing, uh, playing guitar. It didn't make any sense how it was that 
technical but that awesome and that funky and that it, it, you heard there was ja there was jazz fusion and 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 blues and all this mixed into metal and it was like that's weird how i've never heard this before you know i'd never really understood how somebody could get this crazy wild thing happening musically out of guitar like that but these then you got david lee roth just wailing the blues over it and yeah with his like banshee screaming and 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 Alex, just an insane, insane drummer and so locked in because they're brothers, him and, and Eddie. And, uh, and it was just, it was just mind blowing. I just became all in on Van Halen from that day forward. I was mass, I mean, just drawing the VH on every notebook, on every wall, everywhere I could find it. Um, and then, um, and then, the, yeah, that later after a few albums, after Van Halen 1, Van Halen 2, uh, women and children first Di uh, was diver down before or after i can't remember no, I think I guess, it was after. Uh, fair warning was before diver down right it was, right I think. so I so know. when fair warning came out it was like oh man they're mad they're pissed like yeah. this is pissed I mean, off i don't know if they're mad at each other which in, in, in hindsight they were uh <laughs> but it just sounded so angry in the best way. Like Eddie was, his playing is the most pissed off guitar playing. I don't think I've ever heard any more pissed off guitar playing on any record ever than that one. And it is so dark and badass and greasy and seedy and slimy and like dirt, dirty, just everything about that record with mean streets and center swing. And, and, you know, these are just, sorry, I'm having to remember off the top of my head. I don't have any cheat sheet or anything, but like, but that record, like, oh, so I mean, push comes to shove. Yeah. Um, good God. Uh, the, the, the songs on those records, I don't want to hear about it later. Um, well, and that's like what oddly enough, it's weird that that might be one of the least successful records. But real Van Halen fans love Fair Warning. That's like they, the album. Of course they do. Of course they do. It's like it, it's 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 amazing. I mean, it's I think it's the benchmark album for them. And uh, and I wouldn't say that just because people think that because you'll see my selections tonight are are not uh, always the uh underground favorites because i didn't grow up in the underground so i only knew of the big ones hey, by the way i've never like forget that bullshit you and i are both we're about being real that's what yeah. we are you know what well, I mean? like, okay i'm worried I'll about me we're cool anyway i always say whatever we love we're the fucking cool no matter what we love and so love and you and you know and you and so I got to tell you, the next album is so important in my life that you picked News of the World by Queen. And I've got to just let you say this, but I'm going to say this really quick. Fun, it's a funny story. My high school girlfriend, Marie, I didn't even remember any of this shit. But she told me, she goes, Matt, she goes, you showed up on my doorstep with News of the World in your hand when you were 16. And she goes, I was shocked. She goes, I was like, shocked you were there. And you're like, I got to play you this record. And it was like, you know, for me, the first record, I, and I heard by Queen was Sure Heart Attack, one of my favorites. Saw them Amazing. a night, I saw them night at the opera, saw a day at the races, saw the tours, got to write the liner notes for that box at Queen, Crown Jewels. But man, News of the World is like, what a masterpiece. Like the fact again, that I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you talk now. Like, cause I'm going to. Oh, hear no. You. I mean, again, I mean, there's not much more to say except for, we will rock you and we are the champions back to back. And not only that, but they played them back to back on the radio back then. It wasn't a, it wasn't a one song deal. You get, you got both songs and you played both songs back to back. So they were both hits at the same time. And when I hear them now, I can't hear the end of we will rock you without hearing. I paid my dues. Paid. You know, it's just like, you got that voice. You got that voice, man. I love it. You. you can do friends. Uh, you can do but, friends. So good, man. Well, he's he's in my DNA because he's one of my favorite front men and singers of all time, if not my favorite. And I just, you know, growing up being into a guy who is classically trained makes no sense to me because it sounds so not rock and roll. But he was so rock and roll. And that album was, to me, so rock and roll. It was just it was as rocking as sheer heart attack. Yes, it was. But 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 they were like they they knew they had a chance to be bigger and 
and more broad. And that was this album with the appeal. And with We Were Rocky, obviously, biggest stadium anthem air ever. We are yeah. the champions. Not only the, not only a beautiful song, but also I feel like almost like a battle cry for for um, for gay America because he was fighting the stereotype of you know homosexuality and and staying in the closet about it his whole career because he was too scared of it hurting his career. If you can think about a fucked up world we used to live in where that actually mattered, right? Like, you know, yeah. if you were straight or not, and um, and we are the champions is just such a great like. You know, it, and it's just epic. And I loved it. I love how regal all the songs are. You know, it's I don't know. It's just it's such a sick record that one of the the, the, the deeper cuts on it that I'm really into uh, that really was one of my favorite songs and still is, is called It's Late. And that's the oh, ballad. Man, it's the best. And Dude, by the way, you say you love me. Bow, bow yeah. and down, down. So great. It was a single. <laughs> It didn't chart in America, and it no. should. That song is so brilliant. It goes, burn, burn, burn. burn, <laughs> burn, just, burn that record, uh, it's played it's so right. And right? it's just such a rocker. The end of it? Yeah. Sorry, we're talking over each other. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's my fault. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to let you talk. I'm just going to say also, all dead, all dead on that record. Like, maybe like, it probably oh. wrong. Like there was something about that, and the Dude, on that. Like I was fight like, from fight from the fight inside, from fight from the inside. That's like that song could get resampled as a as a as a hip hop jam today. You're welcome. Like it's um, it's just boom, go do do, boom, boom. Yeah, we're it's talking so about the side. badass. It's oh, so yeah. badass. The whole record's bad. And I used to stare at the album cover because it scared the shit out of me as a kid. It was so freaky. <laughs> it was so yeah. like. It was so like, like Stanley Kubrick or, you know, Orwell. It was just this weird, these futuristic giant robots that had the the dead members of Queen in their hands with blood dripping off the hands and holding Brian May and one of them and like and 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 you know their ones falling. I, it's so good, like just. Yeah. It's like I mean, if you were into comic books and rock and roll as a kid, that they, they gave you everything in one album there you know because the album the cover looked like a comic book uh like an like some sort of like weird dark you know imagery i loved it i loved it oh that record's so important to me too man oh. and the production is amazing on it yeah. there i love the production on all those records yeah, I, I, sorry i have oh. to always kind of mention that that i love that a lot of these records it's because of the production on them as well because i'm a producer and and it's my it's one of my favorite things. I was the liner notes kid reading who engineered and who recorded it. And that stuff yeah. mattered as much to me as it did, you know, what, you know, who the band members were. Yeah, man. And, and it's amazing too, because you've taken so much of it with everything you do and you pull from the most beautiful records. Elvis Costello, my Am is true. The first record that he did. And most people don't realize the band was Huey Lewis in the news when they were called Clover. Clover. Yeah, dude. If, if anybody wants, if anybody wants to ever hate on Huey Lewis in the news ever, just go back and listen to that album. Clo uh, that's all. That's all Clover uh, as the backing band and uh, and produced by Nick Lowe. I mean, yeah, and Huey was cool, man. He played with Thin Lizzy, Phil Linnett. Like he was just a good. That guy, like you know, he was like he was rolling around England, man, in those pub rock days. You know, dude. He yeah, he was like his band was almost like. Wasn't he like uh, always like trying to? He was always getting into like shows by the specials, right? Because was it the specials that that uh, that um, that he produced first? That um, that Nick Lowe produced, or who was it? Was it the specials? I think well, it Elvis was. Produced it. Elvis produced it, right? But you know the whole deal. It was like that. He produced. Well, actually, Nick Lowe produced some of it, and Elvis did the rest of that first record. And it, right. And okay. Okay. But he he would he was instrumental in giving Elvis, I think, a lot of his first start, though. Yeah, he um, was. Yeah. And I think it's beautiful. There's that famous dude, story. I just got to make this real quick because I want to hear you talk. But, well, first of all, this is all you need to know. Oh, dude, you have the fuck. Oh, the tattoo. You know what? I want to tell you something. Oh, Butch. Let Go me ahead. tell you something. That record, that record meant a lot to me. And 
And, and I would um, honestly, in hindsight, I would tell everybody, don't ever get your idols tattooed on your body if they're still alive, because you're going to run into them in an elevator one day drunk at the Chateau Marmont at midnight. And you're going to freak out and go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at this. And it was like he and I were the only two people on the elevator. And I was going to my room. <laughs> And, and he was like, like try, he was hitting the buttons like going, oh, that's nice. That's nice. That's, he's trying to get off the elevator really fast. I'm like, call me. <laughs> oh, it's the greatest, man. I love that you love that. And my name is true. You picked that album. The first thing I ever heard by him was Welcome to the Working Weekend. And I'm like, what the fuck oh, is yeah. this? Now, I'm not oh, angry all those songs. Like, and of course, Watching the Detectives. Dude, Watching the Detectives is like, it, it that is still I put that on all the time as like what is a badass sounding like drum track and yeah. just the recording of the drums the opening feel it's like a sounds almost like a drummer and a dryer but it's yeah. obviously an over <laughs> it's an overqualified drummer though that the band was incredible on it but it just it's so good and the just his jazz master guitar shit on that that Elvis does and I mean. It's his his voice and his his lyrics. You know that that record came. Th here's the thing. I have to say, and I can't I can't say uh, that I was early on Elvis Costello because I was too young and 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 too much of a little metalhead punk to even get into Elvis. He was too he's too smart for me. I didn't get it. And funny enough, the first time I heard Elvis Costello, and this is this this is great, almost kind of chron chronological order here. Uh, I remember being on vacation with my family down in uh, Destin, Florida, or Panama City Beach, or wherever we would go for spring break vacation. And um, I had an eight track player, a, a mono speaker, eight track boombox with an eight track player. And I would wear out Van Halen one and Van Halen two on eight track. I had the Van Halen two one, which was, I'd put it in and I'd listen to it all the time and dance the night away and all this shit was on it. And it was so great. And, uh, and I remember hearing a commercial uh, on the radio for Elvis Costello, for some reason, Elvis Costello was coming to town or something. And I was hearing a song playing in the background and, and I was like, I'm not into this at all. But that's the first time I heard of Elvis was listening to Van Halen, which has no, no relation at all. But, um, but I got, I'm gonna cut to the nineties because the nineties is when I was going through a really rough time. Uh, I got married early on in my life. Uh, uh, I, I was, I was like barely, tw I was like 21. And, um, you know, that the, the marriage went South, everything went, went, went to shit. And my career was in the shitter. Uh, we were touring 250 days a year playing for hundred dollars a night, wherever we could get a gig. You know, I, I basically lived and slept in a van and, um, and, and was just, a, I was going through a very lonely, sad time. And I remember, um, uh, I remember getting into this record by Elvis Costello at the time and it just blew my mind and it was a record and I would have made it this record in particular, but, um, and, and it would have been, uh, it was a record called, um, all this useless beauty. And that was a record that came out in the nineties, but, uh, which was a lot of covers on it. But, um, I went back and dug in deep on the catalog and it was also due to a friend of mine who was my sister's boyfriend at the time, who was this amazing lyricist, uh, who just, was one of my he, he's one of my favorite songwriters that nobody ever heard uh and he um he turned he was like saying oh you oh you're getting into Elvis let me okay let me show you this record now let me show you this record and you know it was everything imperial bedroom and and um you know spike and everything later but what record really resonated with me was was my aim is true like when when i put that on and just and listen down i'd be like oh man this is yeah. just this is this is hard on your sleeve, you know. Smart lyrics, yeah. but punk rock attitude, yeah. you know. Stripped Red down shoes. production. Yeah. I mean, Red Shoes is still one of the greatest songs ever. Angels want to wear my red shoes. I love that. So when I used to be disgusted, now you know, I try to be amused. <laughs> I love it, man. She said, "Drop that and left with another guy." That's what you get. <laughs> piece it out. I fucking love that. So love good, right? Oh yep. man, it's a and he's and still, I, you know, he's I'm, still I, I, good. He's still great. And he's, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'm glad I didn't. I saw him this year's model tour when I was younger, but I'm glad I didn't meet him when he was really angry. Later on, I did a bunch of things with him. You know, yeah. I did a, I did a thing when he called me, and I did a because I'm doing a thing for like American Express or something or Citibank. And he goes, I'm going to do two songs, 
Go on stage, you interview me for 10 minutes, I'll do two more songs. And then we did another thing at like this pub that his father knew on the lower east side of Manhattan. But I love the guy. We talked about like our, my brother has Parkinson's, we talked about his dad, we talked about real shit. And I really love the guy. And I, of course I love him as a songwriter. Now, one of my other idols, you have the next album, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Oh. I um, bought a row of tickets for four dollars for the you're gonna get a tour um with a bunch of friends made up of course i i was a working class kid I, they had to pay for their seats but we went and saw them do listen to her heart i need to know and break down american girl uh and you picked the album that was his breakthrough i mean it was it was a challenge in life for him to do damn the torpedoes what a great record even the losers is my tune and also what are you doing in my life but i love that so tell me why you love Dude. that record uh, I love it because of every song on it. And I loved Tom yeah. Petty uh, from the first album. But when that when this one came out, it was like. I remember the video for Refugee coming on yeah. uh, at, on MTV. And um, I think it was MTV or it might have been one of those night flight shows or something like that, too. Um, and it was just wild because. I was like, God, this is cool. This is like there's something different about this when you're a metal head or like a little rock and, you know, hard rock lover, Tom Petty still speaks to you. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. dirty and cool enough. Mike Campbell's playing. He's not a shredder. And if you, if that's, if that's what you were into at the time, you still had mad respect for Mike Campbell and his tone and his melodies and his, his, just his, his riffage was amazing. Like, and the, yeah. the, 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 the op opening, the opening riff in in refugee is just and it's just yeah. so simple and so effective and then just the way he would deliver the vocals you know she got something they don't know we don't talk too much about it you know just super yeah. lazy and sexy and cool it's as shit yeah it's it's got that thing that it was like wow this is like nothing else going on and right. that's why and he just it. just textbook stoner wardrobe with the with the blue jean jacket and you're just like this is this is badass this guy's this guy looks like my 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 cool stoner uncle i love this yeah. and yeah, Tom and, yeah i mean Tom here Perry. here comes my girl even the low even the losers don't do me like that i mean it's just all it's hard to you can't beat that record album covers one of the coolest looking album covers of all time yeah. like that's that i i've i've strived to try to even look half as cool as that on any album cover that I'm on the cover of, you know, just like look cool no matter what, but I'll tell you well, a story. It's from Century city on that album. I did not know that was a place in California as a kid from New Jersey. Um, born in totally. You know, and, but when I was moved to the second hospital after I got hit by the car, tore my head open, broke my leg in half. They brought me to a place called the century city, California rehabilitation Institute. And that's where, I did all my physical therapy and I just, what do you think I was thinking of the minute they pulled me in there? Tom Petty, yeah. Century City. Yes. Like, oh, you, were, you were singing it. Yeah, you were singing it. Yeah. Like it was, you know, it's like every song about a place is in your head and Petty is just one of my, you know. And, and then just to, just to know that he was, that he was born and raised in rocking in one state over from me in the South. Yeah. Gainesville, Florida. It was just like, how did this guy come out of Gainesville, Florida? I mean, this is between that and between that and and fucking Skinnerd. I mean, I, I, I'm sad I didn't even put a Skinnerd record on the list. I could have. Having seven <laughs> records was not near enough. No, I know it's not enough. I'm sorry, I do. I, I hate to do it to anybody, but dude, you know, my daughter Maya lives in uh, Jacksonville, and all my best friends do. And I got to know the whole Skinnerd family. You know, like everybody. All, all like you know Ryan Van Zandt's daughter and everybody and I, man I love those people they're North Florida great. man Northeast Florida had it in the water it's a cool city man you know it's like it's great you know, there's a lot yeah, of history dude, I used to play I used to play the game Jack and like, all the time I always talk to help people I'm like do you realize that that band the classics four came from Jacksonville the one who did oh storm and like you know and spooky and all that song traces of love all that stuff. yeah yeah but anyway spooky. you pick Spooky's one of the greats, and Larry Rivers right. section, right? I'm so, yeah. No, I let me let you talk. Sorry, Butch. Let me talk to you about the next record. Who's 
you know, I talk about him pretty often on the show. I, and I'm not going to repeat the story because if you, people can go back and watch the episodes about how Bruce Springsteen was so kind to me, so nice to me and like s- stood up for me and whatever, you know, like, well, that's, but that's, you got to go back and watch other episodes. But Born to Run is one of the greatest records of all time. And you picked this record. So talk. To yes. You. Again, sorry. I know it's I know it's an obvious one. And I know a lot of people like a lot of like serious songwriters will go like, oh, Nebraska is my record. And I'm like, is it? <laughs> and I know a lot of people. And by the way, it's fucking great. It's great. I get it. Recorded on a four track with one microphone in a in a New York City hotel. Awesome. That didn't speak to me. It's a great record, but that's not my record. My record that spoke to me and spoke to probably millions and millions of other Bruce Springsteen fans around the world, and especially in rural America, was born to fucking run. Fuck yeah. It's, again, again, Curse. no cooler guy on an album cover with a guitar. It's just like there's a pattern here. You go back to back from Dan the Torpedoes to this record, and it's both dudes holding guitars, and they couldn't look any cooler. And yeah. he was and he was just the epit he's the epit is, not was, still is the epitome of a showman, a songwriter, and a dude. He's just, he's just badass. And that record has, oh man, when you go back and, and that was the same thing. I was late on that too, because you know why? Because of metal, growing up in metal and growing up in like hard rock and stuff, you're just not as, you're just not as open to a lot of that stuff a lot of times. So I, I probably heard Bon Jovi before I heard uh, Bruce Springsteen. And I, no offense to Bon Jovi, but it's like, it's clearly his thing is Bruce Springsteen. And, and you know, very much so. Uh, and so I probably bypassed and dismissed when I would see this bearded construction worker yelling at me on MTV. And I was like, that's not my <laughs> thing. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't give myself enough time to, to take it in and digest how incredible incredible of a lyricist that he is um and that was what it was all to me you know you can have all the like production and the hair and the fluff and the and the melodies and the and the big guitar solos all day long but if you're not saying anything then sorry i I, it's not gonna it's not gonna age well with with me especially uh being 50 now like i care about a good lyric more than i care about a fucking guitar solo so it's I can I can put those on and man and there's just a mood and a vibe and 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 it, I'm, I appreciate it even more going back and looking at all these videos now in the age of YouTube where you can look at you know videos of 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 Springsteen making this record with Ivan and 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 just slaving over it and redoing it a hundred times and not able to get the sound out of his head onto tape that he wanted. Uh, and with, he was chasing and chasing and chasing. He was a perfectionist. And man, when you put on Thunder Road or, I mean, put on he's, Born to Run. He's a one at night. I love night. And Jungle Land, of course. Back to Jungle back. Land is the jam. Thunder Road what, is a, like- what an album ender. What an album closer, you know. Yeah, Down jungle. in Jungle okay. Land. And you're just like, and then it's just epic, epic, you know. One of the greatest records of all time. And you know, I love my two favorites are that and Darkness. I love those two records. Darkness but, on the Edge of Town. One of my favorites because Candy's Room is like fucking always been one of my favorites. So I'll start with the language. I'm trying to like stop myself from cursing, but I will say <laughs> I'm not helping. I'm giving. I'm. I'm. I'm I love it. I'm being real so people can get over it. <laughs> Born to Run, the recording is one of the most insanely epic sounding things ever. From the boom, boom. it's like that recording is. One of the greatest things ever recorded. Are you saying Born to Run or? or, song, or Born to Run. The song Born to yeah. Run. It's like, dude, dude it's insane. It, like, it's so rocks, good. Like, it's so good. A rocket. And then it, it's like one of the greatest we were, things. We, we were covering it on tour. We, we were covering it on tour about five years ago. Uh, and I remember we, we played the Stone Pony that night. And I was just like, I'm not taking it out of the set. I don't care if this is too on the nose. And I was just like, <laughs> Went right before we kicked into it, I was like, I was like, sorry, bartenders, fucking deal with it. They're very proud in Asbury, you know, it's part of my stomping ground. You know, I ran yeah. every for years. You know, we're all very proud of it, you know, Bruce, of course. Love. Guys, Love. he's the real deal, always has been, always given so much of himself. But that song, you're right. Born to Run is one of the greatest things, in my opinion, 
if I make a list of a hundred songs or what, you know, 50, maybe even 20, Porter runs on that list. Cause it's just, yeah. It's a, I, I think it would have been a record that, right. yeah, dude. And I think if I would have been a, I think if I would have been a, you know, uh, in a different place in a different time when that record came out and a little bit older, like late teens, uh, this would have been the soundtrack to every summer night. It was just such a soundtrack to small town America, beautiful, romantic, hot, sweaty summer nights. And yeah. I, I can put it on now on a hot, beautiful summer night now. And yeah. it still rings and resonates like it came out yesterday. It does. Beautiful. It does. It, just, it never loses its fucking power for me. That's the thing about Born to Run, man. I just like that song will always be one of the greatest things, in my opinion, ever recorded. I'm grateful in my lifetime. Got to, Agreed. Got to, the man, got to know him a little, you know, a bit, you know, like, and he, I know that he listened to me a lot. We had conversations and um, he's one of the greatest. And yeah, I have consider myself, you know, very grateful that, you know, he had, he backed me through a lot of shit. And that's all. We love him. We love him. And I love him. And I'm proud of him being from my state of New Jersey and your state. What's wasn't funny. I'm born in Athens, Georgia. Raised in Jersey, we always joke about that. Yeah, now, well, when, man, you, you, no wonder you love music so much because you got like all you you got both of the some of the best cities for music yeah, ever. Right. And I'm really bummed I don't have an REM record on this list too. But like you know, we didn't have enough songs to we didn't have enough albums uh, uh, we to do pick love from. REM so. so much, you and I both do. I know that. I mean, we oh god, it's amazing. But I want to talk to you about your last record because we talked about Leslie Fram earlier, and I love her. I mean, her and I went in the studio. With Rick Nielsen, and you know, we went in with Cheap Trick when they were doing the, the, the Super Bowl commercial for the Green Police instead of the Dream Police, and it was winter, and we're hanging out. Robin's got this like crazy hat on. I mean, I love Rick and Robin, and 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 you know, and Tom, those guys, Bunny. I mean, like everybody, I love that band. Huge Dude. guy forever, like I, I, you know, just and they're the sweetest, coolest dudes ever. Tell me what amazing Rick Rick and I become buddies. So, oh, you have, that's great. Yeah, and that that's big for me because also one of my biggest influences was was you know Cheap Trick and 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 Rick Nielsen on guitar. And so uh, I that was a record that when uh, it came Stop out, game right? Stop this game, like things like that. Was that was that on the record? Yeah, Stop this game. Was that on that album? It was right. Was Stop. This I don't know. Later. I don't, I don't remember. I'm trying to remember which record that was on. I don't know. But I don't I, know. I mean, it, it was. It was so great. And we loved, obviously you loved, obviously, you know, like Heaven Tonight too would take it. You're taking me back. I love the power Vo pop. Voice, dude. But voices, voices, that's the song. Voices. Whenever, first of all, Dream Police is incredible. Let's back up. I got the record uh, as a Christmas present from my grandmother, uh, yeah. which, which means that my sister's, told my grandmother what to get me because my grandmother's not going to know to buy me a fucking cheap trick record. Um, <laughs> you know, it would have been like Edie Gourmet or Lawrence Welk's greatest hits. But um, yeah, but quite honestly, I didn't care because I got I got it and I, I I had to take whatever I could get, you know, musically at the time because I'd, we didn't have money. We didn't have a, a lot of money. and We certainly didn't have a lot of selections for albums. So whenever something would come out and it was given to me as a gift, I cherished it and I wore that record out. It wasn't like just like, oh, yeah, I'll listen to it once and throw it away, throw it aside. I would obsess and open the wrapper. That album cover. Come on. I mean, yeah. talk about again when you're a kid and album covers can like influence you. Uh, to want to listen to a record and entice you. Why would you not yeah. want to listen to this record? You had like all four of the dudes dressed in all white in an all white, very eighties, almost like German art, high art, you know, setting like they were in the early eighties. Um, yes. And it was this, it, they're all wearing, you know, police outfits, all white with, with fucking guns and all this. And they're just like in smoke all over the ground and, it was the coolest thing. And then you opened up the center of the gatefold and you opened it up and there was a police lineup and the police lineup was all of the members uh, handcuffed to each of <laughs> the members of cheap trick uh, in their, you know, white dream police outfits. And 
And then out in the out in the audience is the band, the back of the band members' heads pointing out members in the lineup. And it's just like that is the coolest. And I put it on going, please be as good as the album cover. <laughs> Cause yeah, you know, and records- I was wrong. I gotta say, all, all shook up was the one with stop this game. It's funny, like yes. you know, it bled, it bled it bled together with me. But you're right, yeah. dream police. Was but you put on that you, dude, you put on that first song and you put on Dream Police and it's one of the coolest songs ever written. I mean, it really is one of the coolest fucking rock songs. It's so stoner anthem. Just, it's so good. And then you've got like the breakdown where Rick Nielsen sings, you know, I'm wide awake, they they won't let me alone, you know, and it's just, it's so good. And then it goes into, you know, way of the world. I've been wrong. I've been the way of the world. Love that. Yeah. And then, voices just blows my mind that's like to me still to this day i would play that song around a campfire and it's so good you didn't know what you were looking for till you heard the voices in your ear so good right that was me again those guys are the shit and they're the coolest guys too like Dude, like I, they're just the nicest dudes ever, you know. And coolest like, dudes. Stories about how, you know, like Rick, Rick told me, like he's such an Anglophile, you know, that he would just like Kiss. It was a very interesting, different way. But Gina Paul would listen to any WFM things from England. Scott Muni was the DJ. The nicest thing ever, a compliment for me. When I, Scott Muni was a big New York City DJ for years, and his daughter, his kids said to me on the anniversary of his death one year, they go. Dude, you're like the one air parent to my dad, our dad. And I was like, well, man, I, I, it's a major compliment. I, I don't know if I can, I go, that's really beautiful to say. I go, but well, thank you. I, you know, I love their father. And, uh, but, but those guys, Rick Nielsen, Robin, those guys, we were like, they loved English music so much that they ordered the enemy, the sounds and the melody maker, the English magazines. So they would know what was coming out in England. So they love the move. And that's why they did California, man. And like, yeah, exactly. Like, like they were, they dug the move wizard, like, you know, Slade, and, you know, T-Rex and all the great stuff. And I love that about them. Cause I, I just love the idea of a great song that has that yep. like, anthemic pop chorus. I love that shit. I mean, you know, they- they appreciate it. They appreciate a chorus and, and it's awesome. And I mean, Rick, Rick is like, he, he, it's awesome because now we'll just text each other and he's, he's so sweet. Like, I mean, I remember he sent me lyrics to um, surrender because my son's favorite song at the time was surrender. My son's only 12, but like he, he's grown up shocker listening to rock and roll and uh, likes rock and roll a lot more than pop or R and B or hip hop. So he's, um, so he sent my kid uh, these, uh, he sent him some, uh, he sent him a copy of the lyrics that were from the actual h- hotel stationery when, when, when he wrote Surrender. And I thought oh, that was so cool. That's so awesome, man. He, he, also, he also sent me, uh, yeah, and he sent me a, a poster because Rick, Rick is awesome. He's such a sarcastic kind of a, you know, he's, he's a funny dude. And uh, before I'd even met him, uh, I was friends with his kids and uh, they came to uh, a show of mine once and brought a poster uh, of the, and they said, uh, my dad wanted you to have this. And it was a poster of Rick. He was going to try to come to the show, but in, instead I got the poster and, and the poster was of him and it had in Sharpie written at the bottom. It said, dear Butch, so glad I could not be there tonight. Love Rick. Great story about how, he and Tom Peterson went over, like, they, they went to England, like, in 67 or whatever. And they were like, you know, we got to go to England, man. We're going over there. And they, they couldn't even really afford a hotel. And they bought a mono record player. And they bought Beggar's Banquet, I think it was. Maybe, or no, maybe it was, maybe it was before that. But, what it, but they bought Sgt. Pepper. And they're listening to it in a hotel room. And they had to keep putting, like, pence to keep the heat on in the winter in his hotel. Like they just flew over there and said, what the fuck, we're going there. That's a great story, you know? Goes, That's amazing. He goes, we're sitting here. He goes, dude, we loved English music so much that we went over there and me and Tom are like, oh shit. 
you know, it's like, how do we keep the heat on in this room? <laughs> it's like, that's amazing. That's a great story, man. Dude, and, Rockford, yeah. Illinois, man. Yep, Rockford. You got it, man. You know, something Listen, in the water. We got one more. You know, it's funny. I'm going to, the album list is done, but I'm going to let you tell me one more thing about REM. Just because we got to bring it back to Georgia for you and me. So yeah. tell me what, what REM, if you had to pick an REM album or a song, what do you love? My, my probably my first memory ever of them, which was South Central Rain. Um, oh, that man, that was the first time I saw that on the on on I saw the video on MTV. It was probably on 120 minutes or or whatever version of the alternative yeah. cutting edge. I think it was back then. It was like a Peter cutting Street. edge. Yeah. yeah, and and I just remember seeing the video and all of them in this monochrome black and white clothing with black and white drums and guitars and. You know, Peter Buck was playing a black and white 360 Rickenbacker and it just it sounded like the birds or like Petty or like whatever. But it was but a little but even more cerebral and and, and just with Stipes, just beautiful. Yeah, melancholy it vocal it delivery. Sad, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. So good. And just. Yeah, the- and Mike Mills always with his backgrounds were just so beautiful. And like, I loved how his counter melodies were always so interesting. You know, he would always do like this, like he would almost take a lead vocal in the background, sort of like the edge would do to, to Bono on yeah. the two songs on their early records. Yeah. Uh, which I don't, there was the, the parallels weren't that far off back then with, uh, on early U2 records versus, or, you know, early REM, they were yeah. all taking, they're all taking from the same, they're drinking all from the same cup, you know? Yeah, exactly. And those records sound so good. Oh. You know, the South, Southern Central Rain, South Central Rain, like those songs like that fall on me. Don't go back to Rockville. Those songs are fucking so oh, good. I, gotta stop yeah, I love that, man. I just, it, it, it's very interesting, like how sad and melancholy at the same time. How we loved it, how beautiful it was, and those records are so good. Man, what a career! I, and we're, our world is better for that band being in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, it's funny. We, like last time I interviewed Stipe, it was me and Leslie, and it was the nicest thing in the world. Me and Leslie are on the air with him in New York, and he goes, "I can't think of two people I'd rather be interviewed by in the world." <laughs> Thank you, man. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm just saying that because it means the world to me that you came back from those guys giving this band the bongos from New Jersey, who I love, from Hoboken, the seven inch of Sitting Still, and, um, and of course, uh, Radio for Europe. Uh, anyway, Radio for Europe, yeah. But anyway, Butch, man, you and I could talk for hours. I think what we're going to do, you, me, and Jonathan are going to have that dinner, get some friends together, and just talk about, you know, do what we do. This is what we were doing. The funny thing is, the concept of this show, as I came up with it, was like, kind of like what we do. We talk about records we love. And I wanted your fans to hear what really moved you, makes you tick, and what you care about. And I'm really excited about the new record, American Love Story, coming out in May. It's May 8th? What date is it coming Yeah, out? yeah, yeah, May 8th. Yep. And I just want to tell you how much I really appreciate you doing this. I love you. You've always been such an amazing dude, great friend. You know, you did, uh, we connected, you know, with, with artists in so, many, in so many ways over the years. And I just, I know your fans love you so dearly. And to me, that's the most beautiful thing in the world is your, your fan base and you always treat them with so much love and respect. That's what it's about. Well, and well thank you, Matt. And I love you too. And, and the thing that's great about it is, you know, I remember meeting you the first time and it was always, uh, I was excited to meet you because I had been watching you on MTV for so long and going like, this guy loves music. You can just tell when someone loves music and knows it and eats it, leaves, lives, lives it, breathes it, drinks it. And, and, and that was, that was me growing up. So I was like, that he and I have to be friends. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I'm so glad we, we became friends. I loved you. I met you, know, I met you. And I just want to tell you, I'm so excited. Thank you for doing this. And, you know, again, for everybody at crush management who helped us out, like, you know, at Capone and Bob, and of course, Jonathan Daniel and all the crew over there, all dream my, team, dream team, all my friends. Um, and also, you know, like all the people who work on the show, Chris Trevero, Carrie Brown, Linda Perry, um, my friend Andre from Proper Portions, uh, my friend Ann Glenn for keeping me sane, uh, <laughs> like a lot of other things. I'm just, it's really funny because, look, you know, I am so much loving doing this show. 
so grateful. And Butch, having you on today was like, so I was so looking forward to it. And it was fun, man. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I loved it. I loved it very much. I could do this. I could do it every day. Dude, you know what? Maybe one day we'll do something together. Like we should do something like, even if it's a weekly, we'll do something cool together. We're I love it. We should, we, we, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to reconvene about that. But thank you for doing this, Butch. Much love to you, man. You know? Thanks for having me, my man. I appreciate it so much, man. Tomorrow we have Johnny Resnick from the Google Dolls. Thursday, I mean, we've got Ed Rowland from Collective Soul, another Georgia boy who I'm great friends with, who I love very much. You know, and then Friday, of course, Pete Wentz, who's fantastic, from Fallout Boy, who's, I mean, look, it's just, it's hanging with all my friends. It's the best. You know, like this, that's what this is about. I may be in a lonely place, but I'm not lonely because I'm there with my friends talking about music. That's what matters. I want to tell you all, please stay safe. Much love to you. Thanks to Music Cares. Everything that you do, just stay close to the people you love. Let them know every day that you love them, the people in your life. Always tell them you love them. You just don't know what tomorrow will bring. And that's a rule I live by. Um, anyway, so that's it. It's called In a Lonely Place. Butch, thanks, brother, okay? And, Thank uh, you, Matt. All right, I'll see you soon. This is on We Are Here, and it's In a Lonely Place. I'll be back with you tomorrow, 4 Pacific, 7 Eastern. Keep the music in your heart. Love you all. Yeah.